Great. Well, uh, welcome to um, the last but not the least important, I would say the most important session of the day. It's uh, the rising stars in health tech. And these are the stars that uh, we're here to find anyway, right? So um, let's hope that we get 10 very good presentations today and good questions. Um, we have 10 companies and each company have five minutes. Um, so we're told, so we'll try to keep it tight. Um, so you can say, hey, you have five minutes. If you want to have questions, leave a minute at least uh, for a question. And we'll try to um, to also keep keep track of time. Um, we have, we're a little bit behind time. We'll just do a very quick introduction from us and then we'll kick off with the first, uh, the first company of the session. I'll go ahead um, very quickly. My name is Rabab. I'm from Elibad Venture Capital. We are a classical venture capital fund based in Germany. We invest across the healthcare space and primarily in Europe. Um, our second fund generation will have its uh, set final close towards the end of this year, and that will be a 180 million fund to invest really in European um, biotech companies. And the stage, which would be interesting for companies presenting today, is somewhere between C, C to Series B. And um, we're not super early, as the name, you know, mentioned, so um, slightly later. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Thomas Testrup. I'm a principal with Angelini Ventures, a fairly new fund out of an industry group called Angelini Industries. We're a 300 million euro fund. Uh, we're both financial and strategic invest across therapeutics and digital health. Um, we are a little bit the same space in terms of timing, so early to, I would say, a little bit later stage. Also depends on the therapeutic area and space. Um, typically we invest three to five million, um, and we invest in Europe and in uh, North America. So I'll keep it short, and uh, so we can get on with the with the next of uh, the first company of the ten. Um, so we're starting with genomics and its application in infectious disease by uh, Impact Omics and Nicholas, yeah. stage is yours. All right. Hello. I think we find it normal these days that we take decisions based on data on, our, on a daily basis, right? We have data from our cars, our dishwashers, our, our phones, our smartwatches. We equally find it normal when we go to a doctor that we are treated empirically without any solid evidence. I don't find it that normal. Molecular diagnostics has a lot of potential to provide that data. It can allow a physician to rule in, rule out a bacterial infection. It can help treating patients based on their genetic constitution, whether to tailor the treatment, those more or those less. The problem is it's just too expensive and simply we don't want to pay for it. So at Impactomics, we took a different approach and developed a workflow that allows us to bring a variety of tests, molecular diagnostic tests, to a price point of 20 euros and offer that as a service, lab service to physicians. It's in the range of infectious diseases, that's our core focus, as well as um, pharmacogenomics. We signed on our first customer during summer, and by the end of the year, we want to sign on to additional labs by whom we want to bring our tests to the market. Now, this is our first step, but we want to further scale our business. And in order to do that, we want to develop what we call a lab pot. It's a tiny house, but then with an instrument inside. And that instrument, in fact, fully automates our workflow. And in order to do that, we want to grow as a company towards that next stage. We seek for an investment of around two to three million. And in order to do that, we are open to explore this with investors. So happy to talk about this further later on. And I hope I still in time. Three minutes of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Hopefully there is at least one. <laughs> so anyone in the audience? Have, uh... You can no. think for about one minute. <laughs> and so. We have one here. Thank you for your very short and concise presentation. I'm curious about like, uh, yeah. Um, so I'm curious about like, would you mind, because it is a very nice photo, would you mind to describe it a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So this is what I call a lab pot. It's an autonomous lab. 
it's fully uh, foreseen with power, with supplies. And it's a way to bring our testing, initially as a lab service, closer to patients. So the idea is that this runs autonomously. Just one operator kind of operates this pot. It's the same operator who collects the samples from the physician. So samples are loaded into the machine, and then that person who loaded the samples can do another round of sample collection. And this is for us a way to really scale a lab business, which is intrinsically very difficult to scale. So that's the way we want to approach it. Maybe I can ask the next, next question. You know, in a world where decentralization is becoming the key to scalability, you're almost going in a direction where this will cost you a lot of money and to scale across you know, not only regions, let's say one country, but across countries is going to require a lot of capital. So how, how, do you, how are you seeing this? Well, there are two things. I came actually from the other side, I've working for 10 years in point of care diagnostics. And the challenge there is to scale your business, the same problem. And it's finding the right trajectory and the right investment strategy to keep that going. We can talk about this for, for hours. So the way I approached it was indeed different and take a step back and go to this type of centralization. In fact, it's capital, but this capital is earned back pretty quickly. After one year and a half, you have earned back this investment. And this lends itself very interesting for a kind of franchise model where you can place a lot of these units. So this is for us the way to scale. The pot itself is very straightforward. It's tiny houses, they are built everywhere. We focus, of course, on the machine itself. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we will transition to the complexities of gene variants in cancers and their functional assays for personalized treatment. Um, we have with us today from the Netherlands, Arnie, um, who will be presenting to us first diagnostics. Yes, thank you for, for the opportunity to present here today. My name is Arne Kosol, and I'm here to present VIRS Diagnostics. Uh, personal diagnostic to radically improve uh, treatment for cancer patients. A major challenge for the development of novel oncology drugs uh, are the non-responders in clinical trials. And this is not only a huge problem for patients, but also for investors. <clears throat> our solution to this is to, in a centralized laboratory, use our trade secret protected CRISPR approaches to really at scale build cell models that represent all patients. And with these cell models, we can help guide the, the, the drug development and the patient certification and significantly improve the outcome and the speed of clinical trials. What makes VUS diagnostics unique is our combination of deep understanding, in particular in the DDR cancer space, also known as the BRCA cancers, and how we combine that with our world-leading expertise in CRISPR cell-based functional assays. And with these two things together, we can help drug developing companies in the preclinical development of their drug targets, and later on patient certification. <clears throat> and with this data, we can significantly improve the speed and the chance of success in these clinical trials, and we're already doing that with some of the companies that are shown here. We, start, we have started this company as a CEO, but we aim with this investment and future investments to direct the company into an asset-centric data company. The team is me. I have uh, experience now from three startups, including this one, and more than 10 years of research expertise in the DDR cancer space, including also acquired drug resistant to PARP inhibitors, and also working with CRISPR cell-based functional assays. We have Philip Schrauten. He's a trained pathologist, and also have expertise developing diagnostic tools for BRCA cancers, DDR cancers. We have a bioinformatic lead, Simon Sørensen, uh, who also has expertise in developing a diagnostic tool for DDR cancers. And then last but not least, we have Senya Everkind at the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, who's an expert in CRISPR gene editing and cell-based functional assays. We need personalized diagnostic to radically improve uh, the personal treatment process in oncology. Bios diagnostics is an excellent opportunity both for patients and for investors. And I hope you will, uh, and we have uh, also as uh, indicated here, many more opportunities in the future for our platform technology. 
So with this, I hope you will join us on this exciting journey, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions? One, please. So we are planning to, to work closely together with the company diagnostic companies like uh, uh, Foundation Medicine and other companies that are doing the DNA sequencing. So we are depending on that. And of course, also as what we're already doing, further working together with a biotech and pharma company. So we are not depending on any patient material. We are depending on the DNA sequencing result. And then we will at scale in our centralized laboratory build these cell models where we're using our biological uh, understanding of these. For instance, taking into account some resistant weakness that we know of. For instance, like in, in now in the bracket cancer and the projects we are doing now are, for instance, genetic reversion. So the in-frame deletions in, for instance, the BRCA1, BRCA2 genes that restore function of these genes. But then the question is, in such a cell model, are there new drug combinations uh, able to be toxic in such a setting? And you don't know that by in situ approach. Thank you. Any other questions? So we are really sort of a company that wants to work from a very mechanistic approach, but then at scale to really <laughs> radically improve how we are guiding these treatment decisions forward. And it seems to resonate very well with how biotech and pharma companies are working out there. So we need a lot of interest. And we really need investment now to, to handle that interest and further scale and also be able to have a runway that can allow us to go into a more reward-based model uh, using our data. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I think we're out of time. Um, maybe one last question, if anyone has a burning one in them. No? Okay. Well, thank you very much for thank your you time. Much. Thank you. Great. So shifting gears a little bit uh, over to Nano Diagnostics and its application in serious illness and to present is Magnostic Bertrand. Uh, and the company is locally located in Ireland. Thank you. So, um, as um, as Michael said, my name is Bertrand Mandel. I'm here to represent uh, Magnostics, um, which is a company that is a nanodiagnostics company based in the US and Europe. Where our team is uh, is across the ocean. We're a, we're a combination of professionals with clinical research, engineering, and commercial development experience. What we do is bring nanodiagnostics to market. And I'm here to talk to you today about um, something absolutely fascinating, which is acute mesenteric ischemia. Um, so, hence this lovely picture over here. Um, acute mesenteric ischemia is a blockage of the arteries um, around the intestinal region. And if you are a patient that suffers from this and you go into an emergency room, you have a 60 to 80% chance of dying. Um, and that's because today the symptoms are nonspecific um, and there is no diagnostic tool. Um, so as a former ER told me recently uh, when, when we were chatting, basically said AMI is the only diagnostic left once you've excluded everything else, um, which um, means that basically you need to send a patient to the OR on a hunch, which as a physician is not the easiest thing to do. Um, so what are we doing about it? Um, we've developed an in vitro diagnostic uh, that can detect a novel specific biomarker, villain one which is only present when there's a blockage um, in the artery leading to the intestines. And what we're doing is bringing to market two products. One um, is a point of care 15 minute test um, for use in the emergency room so you can triage your patients. Do they have it or do they not have it? Second one um, is a clinical immunoassay um, and the objective of that is to basically assess the level of damage in the patient pre- and post-operative to know what you're actually going to have to do and how, how the, the, the intervention has worked. Uh, what, now, what can you do, which is perhaps more um, interesting and important? You guys, um, as investors, can help support this highly experienced team um, to meet not only the challenge that we have set ourselves for patients, but also respond to... Um, a sizable market opportunity um, and to help us basically in the next, fund the next stage, which will take us to our clinical trials, FDA submission in 2025, continue to build the team. Um, so if you are an investor where you're looking for money, aren't we all? Um, 1.5 million now, 4.4 4 million later. If you happen to be from an Abbott diagnostic, Roche diagnostic, 
for another large diagnostic company, we are looking uh, for a partner to develop the clinical immunoassay. So please do um, come up and have a chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Basel. Um, we have two minutes for questions, so uh, Ace. Maybe we have a couple. Um, so, thank you very much. I think diagnostic space is very interesting. Uh, we all acknowledge the need for diagnostics. However, when it comes to adoption, commercialization, reimbursement, then it becomes complicated. I mean, the, there is a lack of appetite in the European landscape to invest in diagnostics, and a lot of the exits have probably not been the best. So, I'm trying you know, to see if in your, from your perspective as a commercial, commercial strategy, how do you see executing this to bring it to a point where it is attractive to a potential investor? So I think you've raised the, the major point that we face. And I think the, what we see when we speak to investors is those that have actually taken a diagnostics company like this and sold it off, because that's essentially what happens. I mean, nobody goes public. And you sell it off to one of the big players they see how it goes. If you go to someone that hasn't had that experience, they can't visualize that. Um, and I think it's it's a tough road, for sure. And it's an expensive road, and it just got a whole lot more expensive these past few years. Um, but I think for us, one of the benefits that we have is we have a very strong uh, foot in the U.S. since one of our um, one of the members of our BOD um, is the chief medical officer of one of the large U.S. HMOs that has um, already indicated they would participate um, in a trial for us and be our first, our stepping stone in the US. So I think, it's, I think it's, a, it's a huge challenge taking this to market. What I would say is you have to really prioritize. So we, I mean, here I've talked about EU and US. It's, it's not quite that. It's the EU, we're talking about Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, and France initially. And the US, we're talking about the Southwest because that's where we are, Massachusetts and New York. And from then, you can then build something. But those challenges, for sure, need to be resolved. But our first, our first, first major challenge is a clinical trial. Thank you. Great. Thank I think you. that's what we have time for. Mm -hmm. Uh, we continue with genomics and cancer and AI diagnostics. Um, we have a company from Switzerland presented by CISAI. I hope I, I said that right. Um, Moonlight, Moonlight AI GmbH. First of all, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Basel, our hometown, hometown of Moonlight AI. Uh, my name is Cesar Tuskin, and I'm the CEO of Moonlight. And what we're looking at, a fast, efficient, and accurate diagnosis, but also monitoring of cancer patients. Now, uh, I've been lucky to be able to launch many targeted products in the last 20 years that I've worked at Roche, AstraZeneca, and AbbVie. But I think what always matters is when you meet a patient. A couple of years ago, I was close like this time. I was sitting next uh, to a couple and having a, a glass of wine. And then we, sh we started to talk, and then she told me she has um, uh, leukemia. And she was un uh, very unsecure, and when she found out that I worked for a pharma company, she was obviously interested to know more and tried to ask me how I, can, how, how I can help her, which I obviously didn't want to do. But I think where we, when you realize that for patient diagnosis and fast diagnosis, knowing what they're expecting is very, very important. Now, to do targeted therapy today morning was also mentioned, you know, NGS is becoming the, the, the standard of care. But when you look at studies, and lung cancer is probably the poster child for NGS testing and molecular testing, we see that only one third of the patients are actually getting the test so that they can get the right treatment, which costs patient lives. So time, cost, and different issues are a problem when we do NGS testing. And that's where we're coming in. We want to focus on hematology and cytology as key areas and apply machine learning models to identify a biomarker, but also to diagnose patients for the different diseases. 
When I say blood cancer, that's obviously all the elements of blood cancer. But when you look at cytology, 40% of lung cancer patients are actually diagnosed with a smear with an, an liquid environment that the cytologist looks at. The same happens also to ovarian cancer, bladder cancer, and thyroid cancer. So everything is smear-based. And on the right side, you see that the solid tumors are done by histology, histopathology. Now, uh, we have the assumptions that the cell morphology has an uh, sees the impact of genomic uh, disorders. And so the assumption is that out of the cell morphology, pictures of cell morphology, we'll be able to identify biomarker and diagnosis. So how do we want to do that? We're looking at digitizing smears and identifying based on our models, diagnosis, genomics, but also treatment outcomes. Um, we have just concluded our first proof of concept in, uh, in leukemia and have shown that we can identify a biomarker with 80%, with 80% so which means we can identify four out of five patients with uh, computer vision and our algorithm. And we're looking now in disease diagnostics uh, for our second POC. Now, this team, uh, which consists of a whole value chain of biotech and pharmaceuticals from research, uh, we have a physician from Charité, we have uh, somebody, a uh, Christian, who has led the pathology lab in Basel, we have Nicole, she's an AI expert, and myself on the commercial side. We are looking now for $3 million for our new seed round. That's the end. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? No? No, maybe. Yeah, yes, sure. Please, Go please. Did I get it correctly that you're stating that you can predict genomics from the morphology? Morphology of the cells. We have done it in uh, leukemia in one indication with 50 patients. We could identify a biomarker uh, in... Uh, so a certain gene variant that caused that? Yes. Or a driver in that can, so yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. And we are looking now in identifying MDS as a, as a disease out of uh, peripheral blood. And then as a third point, uh, what we're just collecting data is lung cancer, actually, uh, to identify uh, biomarkers and uh, genetic disorders. Any so, other? Yeah, I have, but maybe I have one that follows a little bit the same track, so that's actually interesting. So, so can you say a little bit more about the data that you've trained on and how you link morphology to a certain genetic? Uh, sure. The data that we have currently, obviously, we know. I mean, it's not that, uh, you know, we're just not predicting, but we have the data. So for the train the data, we have the, the biomarker, so the status of the biomarker, which helps us then to identify. And then we validate that with, uh, with the training set. And now what we're looking at, actually, to collecting uh, 1,000 patients in leukemia to, uh, to obviously bring that to an MVP beyond POC. Great, great. Thank you very much. Let's thank uh, Cesare one more time and uh, we move on to our next speaker. So it seems that we're staying in the in the AI track. Um, now we're going to hear about uh, AI-based solutions in healthcare from Messiah Artificial Intelligence. And presenting is Christian. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christian Mogodic. I am uh, one of the founders and CEO of Zaya AI. We are a, a pat digital pathology startup based in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, we develop uh, AI solutions for uh, diagnostic in anatomic pathology. Uh, and our uh, aim is to decrease the errors in diagnostic to decrease the time of diagnostic and to increase the efficiency of pathology labs. Uh, our strengths are uh, a, a powerful team of mixed, uh, a mixed team of uh, pathologists and uh, machine learning engineers and 500,000 uh, cases that we digitalize uh, and uh, we based on uh, future uh, AI models for diagnosis. Uh, digital uh, pathology market now is above 1 billion and is increasing very fast with double digit. This is uh, our um, AI model for urotelial carcinoma. Uh, we, um, we are now for this model in uh, technology readiness level 7. 
very close to market stage. Uh, we are able to identify low grade, high grade invasion and embolite there. Um, and we uh, aim to be on the market with this product next year. The second AI model is already in commercial stage. Is an AI model that uh, identifies mycobacterium tuberculosis in uh, uh, images of tissue. We have, we are now for this model and uh, for another model that identifies mycobacterium tuberculosis in sputum. We are in the discussion with Indonesian um, government to participate on their national program for screening for tuberculosis and deploy their our models. We have also a laboratory information system. We practically we uh, develop and we uh, sell an end-to-end -end solution for digital pathology laboratories. And also we provide remote diagnosis, a telepathology solution. We make second opinion. We have already clients in Romania and we, uh, we make revenues. This is our roadmap for uh, R&D. Next year, we are going to, to develop uh, an AI solution, a prediction model for ulcerative colitis that will be able to predict based on the biomarkers of a, a certain patient what molecule is uh, the best for uh, his treatment. We are going to develop also uh, some other solutions for um, um, genomic predictions, for uh, companionship, uh, and for education, all in pathology. This is our board of advisors, professor of pathologies and uh, senior executives in health tech. And this is our team. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian. So we have uh, one and a half minutes for question. Hey everyone's a bit shy today. Yeah. yeah no. They're waiting for for the reception. <laughs> um, maybe I could ask I could start off. Um this space seems fairly I, I know you hate when VCs say it, but crowded. I mean yeah. at least I see a lot of companies in this area. I don't know about others, but where how can a company like yours this early coming in at this point in time um be differentiated enough but also get that market uh, penetration that you need? Practically, we differentiate uh, through our products. There uh, is no other company that has a commercial solution for diagnosis of tuberculosis on the market. There is no other. There are some research papers that are published, but not, not an AI model that, uh, that is able to identify mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, with such accuracy in tissue. Um, and practically, we focus to develop AI solution for the, the diseases that are not yet uh, already on the, we do not have solutions in the market. This is our main point of differentiation. And we have this gold mine of data, of medical data, that we can use to, 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 to develop uh, AI models that have high accuracy and uh, uh, prepare the data set for training with our pathologies that cannot find such such easy uh, a team of pathologists to, to, to prepare a very large data set. That's what we got time for. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to the next personalized medicine and the use of AI to predict chronic disease. Um, we welcome Renny from OptiChronics um, to present his company. So um, it's an honor to be here. Um, we founded a company in Basel. We've been part of the Basel Accelerator. Um, and we're going to talk about brain health, in particular dementia, in a way. Did you know, two questions, first of all. Did you know that 40% of the cases are preventable? And that we have 55 million cases today, and if we don't do anything, we will have 155 million within the next two decades. Did you also know that when you're over 40 or 50, that you will have more than one illness? on average, two to, two, two to three. Did you know that when we talk about progressive diseases, that we talk about caregivers, and that we try to, 
that we actually neglect them. And that 84% are telling us we need more information, that 40 to 70% of these caregivers have clinical symptoms of depression. A quarter of them might progress to mild cognitive impairment. And we just ignore them. And they spend an awful lot of money in their own care environment. So what is the need? There is a need for a single holistic digital health system. I was ecstatic this morning when I heard the digital um, the presentation about digital health and the need that we need to have platforms. Because when we talk about heart disease, we talk about hypertension, stroke, or diabetes. These are factors in life that are risk factors for dementia, and we need to do something about them. So how do we do that? Imagine a world where you have an application on your phone that is going to risk predict your risk for late life dementia, that is going to risk predict your 10 year risk for stroke or a cardio effect, um, a myocardial infection, and that tracks cognitive change in real time over time. Our personal data is going to inform the intervention, which we base on the five pillars of healthy aging. What do you eat? Are you active? Do you sleep? Um, are you stressed? And do you have these comorbidities? And where we share information with that ecosystem of the partner and the loved one that might be affected by the disease. If we do all that, we might preserve general well-being, health, and memories if you want to have an emotional plea in this game for millions and millions of people. So how do we do this? In 45 seconds, we profile people. You see that on the top left, where we say, OK, we will assess your risk for future disease. We will have a digital enabled, voice enabled digital biomarker that, while you describe that picture that you see in the top left, will actually give you an insight in the six cognitive domains where we might measure deficits. And then we can put interventions against them. Point two is the profiling of modifiable risk factors. We will talk about those, those health pillars. Are you active? Are you sleeping? What do you eat? And if you go off the rails, the safeguards of a digital psychological coach on your phone will try to get you back on track. And on the bottom left, you see those interventions. It's a conversational interface. And on the, 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 on the right, you see how we share information. I will leave it at that. We are a seed company. We, we need um, an investor to get us on board and get us to scale further. We launched in the US not so long ago. Um, I want to bring it into the European market. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Over here. I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> I will say at one. Because like I feel that you have like you propose a solution. No, by the way, very, very interesting. I'm also at the risk prediction uh, space and you'll see afterwards. Um, how do you predict the risk of Alzheimer's, for example, and in which horizon of time, with what precision, in which studies? Because like that's the most complicated thing is to be highly predictive for such disease like Alzheimer's, for example. What do you use as data inputs? Like that's why so many questions. Like that's the dream you are presenting the dream. Like how far are you from achieving it? Let's uh, say you have the money and everything. We don't need the money for the risk predictor because we're actually using a validated algorithm that looks after seven factors in your life. Age, education, systolic, a BMI. There are seven of these, and they, they give you a range of what is your life risk. For, for us, it's more to sensitize people about their risk because you can be in that 40%, you can be in the 60% that we can't do anything about. Right? It's more, okay, now you are sensitized. Now let's... Um, track your cognitive change over time because that's the reason when we need to start working with you fortunately we don't have any more time for oh. questions but i think you will be very popular during the networking so <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll leave and it otherwise that. find me so now we're moving over to medical devices and quality management of healthcare and uh, we welcome carsten to present uh, qualon medical hope we pronounced that right uh, from france Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Carsten Lauer, CEO of Kalon Medical. At Kalon Medical, our vision is to reduce post section surgery death and complications. So what's the problem that creates these death and complications? 
uh, when you suffer from cancer in the column, this is often removed by a surgical intervention. And if you remove the part in the column with the cancer, you need to connect the uh, remaining column ends tightly together. Unfortunately, there are frequently uh, leaks in this connection and you can imagine that your intestinal bacteria like to migrate through these leaks. And that happens, and it's, it's for the last 15, 20 years, the numbers haven't changed. It happens in 10% of the cases, 10, 12% of the cases in the different surgeries. Uh, it requires, uh, <clears throat> in most of the cases, a second intervention, heavy treatment. It's not surprising that this, is a dramatic, this has a dramatic uh, consequences for the patient. These are weak patients. They have maybe um, underwent uh, the, uh, chemotherapy. They are just coming out of a four to six hour surgery and it leads often to uh, uh, the death of the patient uh, leading to 33% 30, death rate in case of this complication. Interestingly, cancer recurrence increases threefold, certainly leading to higher hospital stays. Highly interesting is also that this is a number one litigation case for, against surgeons. There are tests available. They are highly uh, operator-independent, archaic, and time-consuming. And we are proposing the first um, documentable and objectively measurable test to detect these kind of leaks. Uh, it relies on the measurement of the gas composition in this surgery in a laparoscopic setup. Uh, in our first generation, it will be a standalone consumable that we will use. In a second uh, generation, we imagine this to be connected with other devices that help to improve the reliability uh, and the trust in this product. The market is non negligible, I would say. There are 4 million colorectal and bar bariatric procedures uh, worldwide. We are focusing on the lapar laparoscopic procedures, um, about 3 million and the obtainable market uh, with about 1.2 million in the US and Europe. Uh, we estimate that uh, you can generate revenues about 600 million with only the consumable part. Uh, the company was founded by surgeons. They have identified this, this problem. Um, we, they have raised uh, 1 million in the past. Uh, we created a comp uh, headcount of eight people. Um, we ex estimate we need 7 million to get to FDA approval with this device. We have an, uh, a lead investor identified looking for 4 million equity investment complemented by uh, 3 million from uh, BPI France, the company is based in France, uh, and we look for co-investors. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carsten. Questions? We have one. Also. Well, you have these 10% that are uh, in the literature because you, you detect the problem only 10 days or let's say it starts three, five days post-surgery that you develop the infections uh, can go up to 10 days. So I would say that the, the 10, 12% is um, that what the patients that get undiagnosed, the current tests. In some cases, you cannot even perform the test if the leak or if the anastomosis the linkage of the two organ ends is too high up, you cannot do any test. Other questions? Maybe a short one that from my side. Um, so it seems like it fix, fits right into the workflow the surgeons would go through. What's, what's the commercialization strategy? Uh, well, at the end of the surgery, instead of doing this old test, uh, time-consuming test, you have these openings in the belly already. You put in the detector, you measure for two minutes, hands off the patient for two minutes. And you get you document. That's a very important element. You can show that you have done the test, that it showed negative, and that you can, in case of a litigation, use uh, to, uh, to protect uh, yourself for attack. So it integrates well in the workflow. It's a, it's a surgery of four hours. So if you have two minutes to uh, make sure that this leak doesn't appear, 
and you save the patient's life. I think it's worth. Okay, thank you. We'll skip the commercial part for time and reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Kassel. So now we move on to focusing on retinal imaging and diagnostics with the Retinov, and we welcome Sufyan um, onto the stage. Imagine. Imagine that you wake up tomorrow morning with a huge black spot in the middle of your sight, and this might enlarge with time, leading to blindness. Well, that's the sad reality of all people with age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, a hereditary disease that runs in my family. My name is Sufyan Ajana. I'm a doctor in epidemiology, and I've made my fight against AMD my battle. This disease progresses through two stages, an early stage asymptomatic and then an advanced stage characterized by this black spot. Hence the objective of the Retinov startup that I funded, which is to predict but to prevent patients at the early stage from progressing to the advanced stage, allowing them to preserve their vision longer. The main problem today, and I think that we are all aware of it today, is that our healthcare system is preventive. No, it's, it's not preventive. It's not preventive at all. It is reactive instead of being proactive and preventive. I would have loved it to be preventive. And the consequence is that two thirds of the people with AMD today are not diagnosed until it's too late. So that is mainly due to lack of awareness, of course, but also to the lack of tools to help the patients and their optometrist better evaluate the risk of progression of this disease over time. And both these factors lead to significant costs for the healthcare system reaching 89.5 billion euros per year in the EU alone. And that is why we have developed a digital platform called MacuTest to help optometrists with the early screen of their patients at high risk of advanced AMD while providing their patients with regular monitoring based on personalized recommendations in terms of lifestyle. Lifestyle plays a very important role in the disease prevention, but also in terms of reinforced monitoring to help them detect early enough the patients will progress to the advanced stage of the disease to start the right treatment at the right time. So here are the people making their fight against AMD their, their battle. As you can see, there are two handsome ones and two other ones that are a little less attractive. A little heavier pick. Well, I work very hardly and very happily with jean Le Pavec, who is our Chief Operating Officer, Thibault Lefebvre, Chief Product and Technology Officer, and Florent Delorue, our lead developer. And as you can see here, we have a board composed of many opinion leaders in the scientific, but also in the business world. It's very important to know that we become at risk of developing this disease at the age of 50. But after a market study performed by independent experts, we decided to focus on early AMD patients, so patients at the asymptomatic stage, mainly in the UK, US and Switzerland, which leads to a total market size of more than $5 billion per year. About the business model, where today we are starting the B2B2C model, with the optometrist prescribing the solution to the patient, and then we share the revenue, but also we see a huge market opportunity in reimbursement with insurances, but also with pharmaceutical companies to help them enroll patients who are at a high risk of advanced AMD in the clinical trials, testing new therapies or interventions. So we are here today seeking for investments of $2 million. Why? Because we want to go fast. We want to go to the US first, our biggest market. I'm going tomorrow, by the way, to the US to start raising money. So if we can have uh, a little push from here, it will be like, really great. Um, if you are interested in our project, please just come and meet me outside. I'll be having a beer. First round's on me. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, anyone has any questions? There's so much passion, you must have some questions. <laughs> they all want that beer. Yeah, yeah they all want the beer. So. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, very interesting. I mean, I think maybe I will ask this question. Um, in terms of, you said it, uh, our healthcare systems are not geared towards prevention. Exactly. Healthcare systems and health insurers probably say, I already pay for therapeutic, why am I paying for a, for a prevention uh, platform? So how do you think you as an early stage company or companies within your space are tackling this issue? 
Yeah, well, that's why I'm leaving actually Europe. And because, <laughs> because here, like, uh, prevention is not at the heart of uh, people's minds. Here, like, for example, in France, we don't have a health insurance, we have a disease insurance, assurance malady, and that says everything. So it's great to say that prevention is good, but then what's better is to act like if you believe what you're saying. And uh, I'm a bit disappointed, actually. And because I've been talking to many uh, stakeholders in the insurance world, but also in different other areas, and everyone is encouraging me, but no one is really supporting me. So um, I believe that uh, in the US, there is a much more advanced prevention mindset because there are many other uh, companies there in this area that are doing quite well. So I will go there, knock on some doors and see how it goes. Well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. Uh, second last company. Uh, now we're back to surgical technology and medical devices. Uh, we have uh, Chemos from uh, Switzerland uh, representing Spiacot. So hi everyone, my name is Clemens Herman and I'm in charge of business development for Spiacot. So our mission is to pioneer the future of hand surgery with ultrasound precision. So we um, were one of the winners of Swiss Innovation Challenge this year and so our office is now in Mutens, uh, in this canton in Basel. So what is the problem we're solving? The classical treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome and trigger finger requires an incision. This leads to complications, including infections, among other things, or seven, 31 days of sick leave on average. The solution are our instruments and ultrasound guidance. Our solution uh, is composed of two different kits that are single use, and we have to train surgeons for them to be able to use them. That is possible in one or two trainings of four hours. The product, it's been created by two surgeons which, who together have more than 70 years of combined experience in the field of orthopedic surgery, more specifically in hand surgery. I can go into more details, but uh, you can definitely ask more questions about the detail of the manufacturing. The benefits, what you need to remember is that patients have a faster recovery. Uh, the technique is more convenient for surgeons. It also increases their compensation no matter what market you're in. And then for hospitals, it's more profitable. The main goal is to move the surgery from the operation room to the doctor's office, which will result in less costs, also uh, no need for an assistant or a nurse. We do have competitors, uh, however, we are the only one at this stage that have an MDR outright. Uh, we can treat both conditions. Uh, we have a better visibility of the instruments because it's manufactured in Switzerland for that reason. For that reason, And we have a patent for this, by the way. And we believe we are safer, uh, which the clinical investigation data can prove. Uh, we already have KOLs, including in Switzerland and um, other people in Spain, but uh, Dr. Del Pinal, he's also a Mayo Clinic fellow, they believe that we are a game changer for hand surgery. We, as I said, we have the patents uh, in the US, Europe, Australia, Japan. We hope to maybe uh, finish filing a patent in China. As of now, we have a freedom to operate report and our design uh, is protected and we have trademarks. Um, so just so you know, the market size, it's one person out of seven in their lifetime. So several people in this room will get it for sure. Uh, or you maybe know people who already had those conditions. Uh, for now, we're starting with the Swiss and the UK market. Uh, we have KOLs already in Geneva, Zurich, and Ticino. Uh, and then um, we have KOLs in London and Cambridge as well. Um, the roadmap, the main thing for us is to start commercializing as early as October. Our audit is happening this month. So uh, because we've had back and forth with the notified body, which is IMQ in Milan, we expect to see Mark in October of 2023, which is now. Um, hopefully, either we do an early exit or we launch into the US by 2025. Uh, financials were, I can go into more details uh, over a glass of wine or a beer, uh, but uh, we are raising two millions. This is our team, uh, Professor Schwint, uh, who is our founder, Professor Mongundo, who was the founder of the technique. And uh, if you want to get in touch, I'm happy to talk more during the break. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's muster some, some questions. Nope. Yeah, happy to answer during the break as well. So. Yeah. There's, a, there's a nice uh, 
financial table to discuss over a glass of wine at least. <laughs> yes. um, maybe maybe a quick question. You seem like uh, you've quite progressed. So you're already working with distributors, you said, uh, and you're commercially ready. We sign contracts with them, so they have the exclusive distribution rights. Um, what's important to know is that we have remaining markets in which we haven't signed distribution contracts yet. Uh, but indeed, it's it's gone quite fast because we were created in 2020. So it took us three years to get to this stage. And we are already FDA registered. So the two million you're raising now, what would they be used for to sign other? Market growth and to sign with other distributors. One of the key markets being Brazil um, and we hope maybe in Asia as well. But the main goal is either an exit by 2025 or uh, expand with more products. We have other ideas in the pipeline. But as you may know, it's minimum 500k to put a product on the market. So we have to find the right combination in order to scale those products and then see whether uh, our existing investors and our last round on investment allows for those products to be commercialized under this brand name. Otherwise, we'll find a way to commercialize it, but maybe through a different company uh, to allow for an early exit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and coming up to our last company. So those who have not left yet, thank you very much. Um, so we welcome Hussein from the Netherlands on to, to present his company. It's a bit like death by PowerPoint, but hopefully I'll, I'll be quick and brief. What I want to present to you is a platform technology approach, which we think is truly differentiated. Uh, we've got our patents granted in the US just last week and already in Europe. Um, our team have done 10 exits, including in this space. Um, we have traction with clinical data, with preclinical data, and we've secured license agreements with two of our strategic uh, targets, including acquisition targets. My colleague Matthias is here with me, but we have a, anyway, we have a team including a world expert in sepsis who was really the origin of this technology. And really the problem that we're solving is that uh, right now, in order to assess somebody's perfusion, you rely on macro parameters. So somebody's blood pressure, their heart rate, their urine output, um, and sometimes even something simple like a pillory refill. So you press your finger, it goes from pink to white, and you see how long it takes to go white uh, to go pink again. But this really looks at the macro climate Whereas a lot of what happens, the disturbance in the circulation happens in the microcirculatory environment. And so what we've shown through clinical data is there, a di there is a disconnect between the microcirculation and the macrocirculation. And typically you see things happen in the microenvironment about 12 to 24 hours before you see in a blood pressure. And this gives you the therapeutic opportunity to intervene. So the third picture there is our marketing uh, expert. So his daughter had sepsis. And um, she had normal blood pressure, normal urine output. And it's only when you look at the microcirculation that you see a truly differentiated picture. So we assess this by uh, lo looking under the tongue. Um. Slide is not showing up here. Oh, here we go. Okay. So we have this device which you put under the tongue. It's non-invasive. And through uh, LEDs, which we shine around the field of view, and then a sensor which uh, diffracts the light and receives it through the, the optic uh, tube, you then see these pictures here. And these are short video clips of tiny capillaries, about one-tenth of a, of a strand of hair. And that gives you a unique insight into what's happening to the patient. And each of these diseases, like sepsis, like heart failure, like shock, exhibits a unique clinical uh, fingerprint. And we use that with our AI algorithms and proprietary data from devices we've deployed in 50 centers across the world in the Far East, in Europe, and in North America to be able to arrive at a differential diagnosis and quantify tissue parameters. So the blue and green LEDs there allow you to see visualization of oxygen at the point of delivery in the tissues. Now we have got a platform technology, as I mentioned, so we've clinically validated it in all of these use cases from everything from ophthalmology to nephrology, but clearly the first use case is in critical care. Um, and so what, what we're trying to do is to focus on the, uh, a patient population which is prone to shock or septic shock. Um, and so you have a patient with a high premorbid state, they go for surgery, they experience some sort of hemodynamic instability in the middle, and they come out the other, other end with these complications. 
So the, the OEM license custom that we have is really focused on using this in a pay per use model at approximately $50 per use. And um, assuming you have just focusing on the, 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 the highest risk surgeries, we estimate that to be our sum based on approximately 20 measurements. Uh, and this is validated by an external go to market agency that did this work for us. Uh, so in summary, we have traction with existing uh, license deals. Um, we have granted patents. Our first raise, external raise of 5 million um, supplements, what we've already raised in non-dilutive funds of just under 2 million. And that gets us to the point of first commercialization um, and, and to be able to grow our praise firstly in the US and then hopefully in Europe thereafter. Uh, we have got commitments from a family office and a VC, but are looking for a lead investor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, I will. I will start with the question, and um, and uh, perhaps um, lost my. But you, it seems like you've done a, a lot. Um, so, what do you need to do to get acquired? So the conversation we have with Edwards, who is one of our strategic uh, companies, they want to see regulatory approval in the US um, and they want to see it being used. Uh, they've got a technology which allows you to visualize um, some parameters in their in their key center and they want to see how can they integrate the micro and the macro. Um, and so they've identified uh, 10 centers in the US that they want us to focus on. They have our prototype device in Irvine, California. And um, so we've got clear milestones that they want us to hit. Um, and, and even with Philips, for example, the conversation there is about uh, neonatal intensive care and using it in the urgent care, so the pre-ICU setting. Right. Um, if no further questions, thank you very much for everyone and all of our speakers. And you can find everyone outside for, at the networking event. So thanks a lot. Thank you.